We talked to legendary rock and roll photographer Henry Diltz about what's on the other side. I'm John Bowden on Rocky Stream Music. Most of my life I've been a spiritual cat. First I studied theology. I was always interested in world religions. When I'd talk to an artist, I'd ask them what they believed in. Who do you think brought us here? Where do you think you're going? Talk to George Benson about being a Jehovah's Witness. Ravi Shankar about Eastern religions. Before he died, Dan Peake, formerly of America, and why he left the band. I'm probably leaving a lot of people out, but it's something that's always intrigued me. And as much as I enjoy talking to Henry Diltz in the beginning of the interview, where we talk about the Eagles and America and photographing Crosby, Stills, and Nash and the Doors, I really enjoyed the last part of it where we got into religion. The same thing happened, as I mentioned, with George Benson. So we talk about that stuff and a lot more with the great Henry Diltz. You can't die. You just change form. You go to the other side. You walk into the next room. You drop your body. But but your energy remains. Your soul, your, you know, you are, you... you you can't destroy energy. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to laugh at me because you've got a few years on me. Uh, like I said a while ago, I, I turned 60 in February. And having turned 60 in February and, and uh, you know, I've uh, I've lived my life a little bit a little on the wilder side. And I tell this to all the, the rockers that I talk to and they laugh at me because they've got a lot more years than me. And I say, well... Do you are you checking out as the Doobie Brothers would say? Are, are you cheating the hangman? Are you is is are you aware of that? Do you live day by day because you're losing people that you that that your cohorts? You're losing these people. I lose them, but I don't consider it losing them. I say, well, I'll we'll see them on the other side. You know, I mean, the fact is, I believe we know this now from the gurus that we read and uh, Swami Satchidananda and the Dalai Lama and Yogananda and those books, you know, about your soul lives on, you know, and then there's the people who die in the operating table and come back minutes later and tell a story of going through a white tunnel and seeing their relatives and the colors were amazing. The music was amazing. I can't even describe what it was like. And then they come back and somebody said, you have to go back. It's not your time now. And they come back. I mean, there's a, there's a psychiatrist who has, who has deep, deeply hypnotized thousands of people and, and taken them back to the time of their last lifetime and their death and what happened after they died. And that, because usually we're on the other side for a period of time, probably 100 years, because we reincarnate with people that we've lived with before because we have karma with them, you know? Because when you come back in your next, next lifetime, you want to be with your wife and your kids and your mom and dad and maybe your grandparents. All again, you know. You're, you're, you try you're preaching to the choir because I spent the 80s reading Raymond Moody on NDE experiences. I I, uh, I immersed myself with all this because I, I remember going, you know, it's, it's like anything. You go, am I religious? I'm not religious. And what then... But I have that enough energy to be religious. But if it's not religion, then what is it? Then you go this side. Spirituality. Yeah. It's being, being – religion is what man, you know, organizes all of that into and says, here are the rules. And, you know, they talk to you about how you ought to be. But you can get that from just the ether. I mean, that, that's a natural thing, you know. You just feel that because you're alive and you can feel all that stuff. I mean – I mean, don't get me started. I mean, there's angels, there's spirit guides. I mean, we don't see them, but they are there and they do help us. So there's all of that. Okay, let me interrupt you. Let me interrupt. We're on, I, I remember I got a picture with George Benson up there and I asked George Benson one day. It started with George because I know he was a JW. And I remember there's a part of me that I'm going off the record. I'm going, that is just beyond my comprehension. But I said, George Benson, a, J, a Jehovah's Witness. Oh, okay. George Benz. So I came up to George. I'm going to say, George, I'm going to start a series. And, and since it took three freaking months to get this interview, I want, I'm going to ask all the religious and non-religious people about what the hell brought them here. He says, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I was told with George Benson, if he starts sounding like he's getting tired, ask him about being a Jehovah's Witness. You'll have him for another half hour. I'm going, and no disrespect to him at all. I mean, I, I love George. So... And he just said, I said, I said, why are you a Jehovah's Witness? Tell me. And he says, well, it's because I know what every other male JW was thinking at the time. And I asked him to explain it, but he never really did. But he tried. And it was great. So I, I asked Dan Peake the same story. Why would you leave America? Uh, I asked Randy Meisner. And he gave me, a, like, a lot of people. So right. when did you know, the way you think now, Henry, when did that start for you? And what made it, what made you think this way? 
Well, you know, as a kid, I went to, I went to, uh, not church, but uh, Sunday school. You know, I remember as a little kid going to Sunday school. I'm in church. I sang in church choirs. And that was lovely. I mean, I guess it's something you're saying, wow, life is good. I mean, there was this guy, Jesus, who was amazing. And he taught us how to be good human beings. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's all great. You know, and thou shalt not. And you should be this way and that way. But I think, you know, when I when I became a, kind of a hippie musician and then a hippie photographer, and I will tell you, in the middle, in about 64 or 5, I picked up Yogananda's book, Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda, right? An orange book. With a I have book. it. I read that. And, and it was at the time when I was a full on musician. I was smoking pot, you know, pretty much every day. But once again, to awaken, we wanted to know, we wanted to feel life more fully, you know. And then I was taking a few psychedelics. I took acid a few times. And wow, I mean, there's way as, as, um, uh, the Grateful Dead, Jerry, um, that guy, Jerry. Garcia, yeah. Yeah, that's it. See, can't, names are flying out the window. Jerry Garcia, the first time he took uh, LSD, he said, I knew there was more going on than they were telling us. You know, And that is certainly what you learn, right? So in the midst of those year or two, sometime in that year or two, I can't remember specifically the day, but I picked up that book somewhere yeah. and read it. And I said, my God, this life can be like yeah. this guy is talking about. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. want that. I yeah. want to be like that. I want to know about that, you know. So I've been in various meditation groups and talked to various people about it. And, you know, what is, you know, Om Yoho Ringa Kill Om. How do you do all that? I do you ever about, take TM? No, that's all fine. I happen to join a group called Subud. S-U-B-U-D. And what's, what are they about? Well, they're not about anything except surrendering to God. It's kind of a it's kind of a Muslim thing. It started in Indonesia, and a guy came to the U.S. and taught this. All the men go in one room, all the women in another room. You stand there, and when they say begin, you just oh, you just open up and you feel energy. You feel the universe, and it's not something they're doing to you. It's just you learn to do it over time yeah. so that at any time you can just say, oh, I'm going to plug into that that feeling of being alive that I'm going to. You know what I mean? And what's and it called again? Turn, what's it called again? Subud. S-U-B-U-D. There's no book. There's no teaching. You just plug in. And the, and the idea is to teach you that, you you know, like you don't have to go to church to get that feeling. You can do it anytime, any place. You can just say. Bring it on. I want to feel that. And it's a way of turning your mind off, turning all that off and just feeling the being alive, you know, feeling that spirit, that energy of being alive. But let me let me ask you, have you have you ever had yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but have you ever had and this is not about religion, but have you had a religious experience? That Well, that was always a religious experience. <laughs> I can have it, you know, every morning in the shower I can just say, Oh, thank you. I mean you know, then I tell you, some years ago, I heard about a lady named Carolyn Mace, M-Y-S-S. -S, and she is like a new age guru. And she could look at a person and say, you know, you're having a problem with your, you know, it's your stomach or your heart or your lungs or whatever. And she, after doing this for a long time, she was a medical intuitive. Medical intuitive, and, yeah. And she learned that the reason she had that was she was electronically accessing their chakra information. It's just something she had, a gift. And then she went on to teaching people about that. So she became a big teacher. And I went to three seminars, three weekend seminars. Now, she, yeah, you can read all of her books. There's six or eight books, Energy Anatomy. I'm familiar she, with her. Yeah, she was yeah. on PBS. She was actually on PBS. She's an amazing lady. And what I learned from going to all these seminars was a wake-up exercise where you where you energize each chakra in the morning. So since I'm a musician and a photographer now, I don't have to jump out of bed at 7.30 and go somewhere to work. I can get up at 10 o'clock. I can wake up at 10 o'clock and lie there till 11.30, you know, in bed, thinking about each chakra and what that covers. You know, you being alive, other people, you know, your ego, your heart, your, you know, your intention, your... 
and I just energize each chakra. That's what she taught me. So, I mean, it's an ongoing thing. You learn and you learn. And I picked up a book about Archangel Metatron. He's he's an archangel. He's the number one archangel. Well, I, I I'm looking just, all this stuff up after I talk to you. Okay, I mean, a lady named um, uh, let's see, Vanden. Vanden Einden. Some, no, her first name was something else, like Rose Vanden Einden. Last name E-Y-N-D-A-N, something like that. Okay. Anyway, she wrote a book about angels and archangels, and then she um, w w she channeled Archangel Metatron. He talked through her, and she wrote it all down. Here's what I want you to tell the people, and she put it in the second half of her book. And he says, dear ones, you know, let me tell you, you know, they're, they're, they're questions people in her congregation ask. Well, how do we know the angels are there? And how do we know? And what about this? What happens when we die? And he tells the whole, he tells, talks of all of it. It's so wonderful to read. And then you can read that art. You know, you can read uh, Autobiography of the Yogi. That's the one. I've got that. I, I read it in the 80s. It changed my life. It really did. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then there is Swami Satchidananda. He's the guy who was at Woodstock in the yellow and the orange robe, and he did a wake up exercise, which I missed. But years later, I met him through my friend John Stewart, the folk singer, and he has a book called The Golden Present, and it's got a date for every day. The Golden Present, Swami Satchidananda. And um, he tells a little parable for every day, and you read that, and you, oh, wow, that's so amazing, and you start your day off that way, or read it in the evening. Here's my favorite. He says, we are, of course, we're here to learn. We know that. Therefore, we're all students, but you should think of yourself as the only student, and everybody else is your teacher. Ooh. Yeah, right? I mean, it kind of changes things, you know? It changes your day. Yeah, but for no, for instance, Henry, for you to find, uh, for you to find wealth in what you just told me, everything was there, and that's what brought me to spirituality because I was the kid writing in my journal, and when you when you write in your journal, you're writing your journal when you're not feeling very happy. So, and mm -hmm. songwriters write songs when they're not very happy sometimes. Sometimes, but was there a time where you ever felt lost, which brought you here? How do you find value in this unless you were you must have there must have been a time where you were lost. Or was there? No, no, not. I mean, I was really busy, you know, going to college, studying psychology, singing in a coffee house, doing all that. I think the people I sang with, <clears throat> Cyrus Fariar, was in our group, and he was a he was half um, Iranian, half Persian, right. as we say. Yeah. And his father was the Persian uh, education minister under the czar, and his mother was a Welsh actress, and he was a philosopher. He was in our like the, the oldest guy in our group. And he would say the most amazing things all the time to me. And I would start writing them down. So he was my first teacher in that way, I think. And he would talk about angels and the Akashic records and yeah. stuff. And then and I would smoke hash with him and we'd talk about life and think about life. And I would start, yeah, it is amazing. I'm I'm getting into this now. I'm starting to think about it. You know, what is this? Why are we yeah, here? Yeah. Who are we? I mean, when you just say that one day, you know. Yeah, but and then Yogananda and then Carolyn Mace and Subud and each thing, you know. I mean, like any week you, you learn new stuff. Do you ever read things like The Way of Zen by Alan Watts? Do you ever read stuff like that? I know that book. Yeah. I mean, I've dabbled in I probably own most of those books, you know. Yeah. Well, but but the way you think, though, the way you think, weren't there a lot of artists, especially the Laurel Canyon kind of people? They were all kind of, I mean, a lot of them were just plain hippies, I'm sure, but weren't they really open to this? To some extent, some were. I know Cyrus, who I said, you know, yeah. he's the one who introduced me to Suba, this, you know, come on, we're going to this kind of meditation group. Roger McGuinn went to that. Well. His name was Jim McGuinn, and he went to Subud, and he changed. You, you could change your name because they say, well, once you become opened and you have this life experience and start feeling things, you change. Now your name, your old nickname, my name used to be Tad, T-A-D, all my life, Tad. That was your and real this, name? Yeah, well, my nickname. On my birth certificate, it said Henry. My father's name was Henry, who died when I was nine. No one ever called me that until this guy Cyrus, when I was in my middle 20s, 
I walked into his coffee house. We formed this group eventually. He started calling me Henry. I don't see you as a Tad. I see you as a Henry. So, because our parents name us yeah. before they even know us yeah. in most cases. And so, you know, you're, 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 you know, you're a Charlie, but really you're a Reginald. I don't know. I, you know, whatever it is, you know, um, my, my Cyrus's wife, Rusty changed her name to Renee. I was married to a beautiful lady named Sherry and she changed her name to Elizabeth, which was much more befitting. She wasn't a Sherry. She was Elizabeth. She became a, a lady, you know, you, it's, it's, you pick a, a name that fits you better as you change. I do. You, I do agree with that. But, but don't take this personally. Uh, yeah. I ask a many people, half the people, when I get a, a vibe with them, okay, where are we going when we die? Where are you going when you die? Oh, what do you think? Okay. Well, listen, I told you about the psychiatrist who hypnotized people, deep hypnosis, right? Yeah. You, well, you leave your body, like in this book, like somebody will say, hey. I'm dead, but but I'm not dead. Right. I see all these people around my body grieving, right. but hey, everybody, I'm right here. You know, well, they can't hear me. Well, you, you go, you leave, you go through a kind of a white tunnel or something, you travel yeah. through something, and then you come to another place where you see your old soulmates that you didn't even know in this lifetime. You see your soul group of people, you see your family, you see... Um, one lady, um, Sylvia Brown, wrote a book called Life on the Other Side. I she remember. Said, yeah. Don't expect people on clouds playing harps. She says there's museums, there's libraries, there's parks, you know, there's concert halls. I mean, uh, so it, um, what, I was going to make another point about that, you know. Um, but you go over there and, and you learn, you keep learning. You know, and then you come back down for another time on, on Earth. It's all a, a long process of learning and becoming. And But that's a question a lot of people ask, though, Henry. Sorry to interrupt you, but, but uh, people have come up to me, and I've been in all – I used to be – I was a Buddhist for like eight years, and I still practice a lot of that. Uh, okay. I, I – uh, my, my daughter – my autistic daughter, Wonder, just came in. That do dog's very uh, – uh, 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 the dog's very protective of her. But I've been asked, and I'm sure you have, people would ask me, hey, John Bowden – do you want to come back? And I'm going, why wouldn't I? I'd love to come back. It's This has been fun. You know? Yeah. But what, what do you say to that? Well, I think we learn lessons. And like I said, half the people in the world are in kindergarten, maybe three quarters. I don't know. A lot of people, they're beginners. They're beginners, intermediate and advanced. I think when you get to the other side, according to this book, Journey of Souls, that's the book with this psychiatrist. I can't think of his name. I can look it up. Journey of Souls. Yeah, you can. And, um, he, I mean, when you get into the middle of the book, he's talking about people are describing what it's like between lives. And they're learning. They're with groups of people and they're learning. They have masters and they have people and they, they live a one. I mean, it's supposed to be better on the other side, you know. So nowadays, when you get to be my age in the 80s, I'm 80, you know, 81. And a lot of my friends are walking into the next room and I'll get a call. Did you hear so and so died? I'll say, yeah. Good for him. He made it. You know, he, he's he's fine now. He doesn't have that sore leg or that diabetes or whatever it is. He's he's 100 percent now. He's having a great time. We grieve him because he's not here in our lives anymore. But he or she is, you know, wonderful. The best they've ever been, you know, because this is the hard part. The other side is yeah. easier. I had a friend. I had a friend uh, years ago, Henry, who who came up to me and says, uh, "Why, why do I not feel anything when I go to a funeral? I must be a sociopath." Or and 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 uh, he came to the conclusion after reading. Someone told him, hey, "Maybe you're just a spiritual guy, and maybe intrinsically you're pretty happy for them." And he found he's the most spiritual cat I know because his body was telling him that. Yeah. Well, I I don't usually go to those. Uh... I mean, if it's one of my very, very best soulmate friends, I would go, you know, but but I, I prefer to just remember them. I don't want to see them laying there still, you know, if you if you see that. But I want to remember them in life, really. Um, yeah. And although from this book, Journey of Souls, you know, the guy says sometimes we stick around for a few days. We want to see what happens. That's true. Some people, maybe they're those kindergartners, you know. I want to see who comes to my funeral, you know. Oh, I don't I don't think I have it. There's a when my brother passed away, um I just found the picture. 
Uh, we took pictures. We're Catholic, so I'm not a practicing Catholic. We took pictures at the funeral. We always did dead people in caskets. They always do that. Right, right. When they came back, all the pictures of my brother, the day of the funeral, there's a haze around everyone. Same roll of film, the pictures before the, the, the last day, before he died, there's no haze on any picture. The pictures that we took on the same roll after the day he died, no fa- no haze. We're surrounded by by a haze in all the pictures. It's in something, who knows, you know. But being a Catholic, I mean, it's like me going to Sunday school, learning about Jesus, who was an amazing teacher. But, I mean, that's the beginning, you, you know, and then it gets more and more, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, deeper and deeper into what the mystery is. It's a mystery of life, you know. You, were, I knew you were going to inspire me, but I didn't know you were going to inspire. I don't know how you's done it, but I know you's done it. Uh, I, I'll tell you, if you read that book, Journey of Souls, that'll change your life. Yeah. Um, Archangel Metatron, that'll change your life. The, oh, I'll the, read the, it. The Present by Swami Satchidananda, fabulous. And you yeah. read that thing every day, and you know, one little thing takes you two minutes. You know. Yeah. Yeah. You say, wow, what a great thought that is. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. We'll have more from Henry Diltz coming up next week. Make sure you comment on our videos, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. You want to buy a print from Henry, there'll be links in the description of this video. Also links to buying a t-shirt from Rock History Music, Rock History Book, or Rock History Canada. I'm John Bowden. Take care of yourself. <laughs> <laughs>